You're fired. I'm fired. That's what he said. Goodbye, my feet. You missed something. $430 million loss. Could turn into twice that. I'm the one who pays off the cops to make the problem go away. That's what I do here. Let's talk about finance lessons from the 11th episode of Billions based on my work experience at Goldman Sachs in New York City and based on my work experience at the top hedge funds in the world. Now, please be sure to comment, like, and subscribe and stick around because at the end of this video, I'm going to grade the episode for Wall Street Realism with a buy, hold, or sell rating. Three key topics in this episode that we will discuss are number one, how to protect your money from a massive loss so that this does not happen to you. I made a mistake today that I shouldn't have. Could cost me a billion dollars. The second topic is how to massively reduce the risk that you get fired from any company so that this does not happen to you. What the f***? wants to see you. Door's always open, you know that. I love Mafi. He wants to talk about Biolance. Oh, well in that case, fire it. The third of three topics is what is the one quality that many billionaires like Bobby have in common that makes the best investors want to invest in them and why your biggest perceived weakness is actually your biggest strength. I'll also teach you how to create unstoppable confidence so you can take your career to the next level. And behind every billionaire is a different motivation. I was just thinking about getting rich and getting even. Does it make everything all better? Topic one, Axe might lose 10% of his portfolio due to one bad trade with awful risk management, even though his trader Mafi told him to sell the position. I compare our position before the call. I'm just afraid we're gonna lose. All my research is telling me that approval is a coin flip. Hedge funds are all about managing risk. And in this case, Mafi says it's a coin toss, meaning a 50-50 chance of making money, which is almost as bad as casino odds. Plus, the risk reward on the trade is not favorable. Now, what does this mean? Well, with a long position, meaning a stock that you own, you want the upside to your target price to be much higher, of course, than the potential downside, which is often a technical floor in the stock. And this is referred to as a favorable risk reward. For example, if a stock is at 100 bucks and your valuation PE-based target price is 70% higher at $170 and the downside is $10 at a technical support level of $90, then the risk reward is 70% minus 10% for a positive 60% risk return. Now, this trade that Mafi is referring to is more complicated because the reason they own the healthcare stock is because of potential FDA approval of the product that the company wants to sell. And this is referred to as a catalyst, meaning the reason they own the stock as Bobby mentions right here. First, I told you yesterday and the day before that I understood the risks. I've done the channel checks, I've done the homework. Biolance's inhibitor is gonna be lights out. Six other companies have inhibitors in the works. Only one's gonna want approval and market share. Not accurate, because Bobby talks about channel checks, which has nothing to do with FDA approval. Channel checks refers to finding out from a few sources that sales are going to be better or worse than expected for a given product. And it's illegal to do if your channel check is talking to a sales rep at a publicly traded company who says that business is better or worse than expected or that, or that the sales rep is going to beat or miss his or her quota for that quarter. Now, the way that I used to do channel checks was not talking to people at the company I was investing in. Rather, per these pictures here that I took years ago, I would analyze Black Friday holiday sales when investing in tech companies in order to see if in general, foot traffic or demand for certain products was higher or worse than expected. Now, other ways that some hedge fund investors do channel checks is, and please do not do this, but they drive by the headquarters of companies if the last day of the quarter is on a weekend. And if they see many cars in the parking lot, then this might lead them to conclude that the company might miss the quarter, especially if the parking lot is close to where the sales reps actually work. Now, since a lot of people work from home these days, counting cars on the last day of a quarter might not be as reliable. But some companies, even hedge funds, some hedge funds even rent satellites to count cars. And by law, C-level executives, meaning CEOs and CFOs, are not supposed to talk to any investors in the last two weeks of a quarter. And this is referred to as Regulation FD, meaning fair disclosure. Why? 
because you cannot regulate body language. And if a hedge fund meets with a CEO who is in a really stressed out mood on the last day of a quarter, then this could imply that the company might miss the quarter. And the way that Bobby finds out that the company did not get FDA approval is from this conference call that all investors have access to at the exact same time. The next voice you hear will be the Bioland CEO, Brooks Welliver. We were just notified by the FDA that we were denied approval. Accurate. Because the company told the market about the lack of FDA approval on a, on a conference call, which is also available to all investors anywhere in the world to listen to over a webcast. And we retail investors by law get access to the same information as hedge funds do at the exact same time. And of course, the lack of the FDA approval means that the stock is going to get slaughtered. We estimate a time horizon of five more years to complete fixes. But at our current burn rate of cash, we only have three years of operating experience. Not accurate. There's no way a company would say that they're, that they're going to run out of cash in three years, especially since many companies, especially tech companies or biotechs that go public, might run out of cash in a few years if they cannot become profitable. And cash burn is something often discussed with private venture capital backed companies and not publicly traded companies. Specifically, the cash burn rate means how many months, not years, how many months of cash they have left. For example, if a company has $1.2 million of cash on their balance sheet and no debt, and if they lose $100,000 per month, then they have 12 months left until they have to often raise more money from venture capital firms in order to do a B or C round, for example. And the reality is, if a company thinks that they're going to run out of cash in three years and they're publicly traded, then the CFO will talk to investment bankers about raising more cash through either a debt or an equity offering. They certainly would never tell the market that in three years they won't have money left. So the stock will get crushed as the company did not get FDA approval. Now, what's the damage going to be to Axis portfolio? What's the damage? This talk is halted until the morning, but there are no bids in sight. It's going to be ugly. $430 million loss. Could turn into twice that. Now, when a company releases really negative news, the stock can be halted until the company explains the news to the market on a webcast. Now, assuming that Axe's assets under management are about $10 billion, this, speak, this could be close to a 10% or $1 billion loss. And this is awful risk management. Never let a position be more than 5% of your personal or professional uh, assets that you manage. And I recommend having at least 20 positions in a portfolio in order to mitigate risk and try to not have more than 20% of capital in any one sector, like biotech, for example, because companies in a given sector can be really highly correlated. Secondly, if you're gonna have a massive position in your fund, please consider using options to protect your capital, especially close to a material news event like FDA approval. So how do you do this? As you can see here, these computers are using Bloomberg software. And most hedge funds use Bloomberg to get options details. But you can get the same information for free by going to finance.yahoo.com, which we will visit together in a second. And protecting your investments with options allows you to protect your investments, kind of like with an insurance policy. For example, I have a life insurance policy that costs me this much per month. And God forbid something happens to me, but my family will get a very large amount of money that is way bigger than the small amount that I pay for the life insurance each month. And I'm certainly worth more dead than alive. Similarly, with options, you can buy a put that'll protect your long position, meaning the stock you own. And if the stock drops a lot in a given time period, this put goes up a lot in value. And if the stock goes up, then all you lose is the amount of money that you spent on this put. And per these spreadsheets for my students, I teach how to use many different option strategies. But when you buy a put to offset a long position, this is called a married put. And let's actually use biotech giant Moderna, for example. Let's go together to Yahoo Finance, and the way you know if a stock has options is you click right here on options. And if you see options data come up here, then the stock has options. 
And right now, Moderna is trading at about $104 per, per share. And let's say that you knew, you knew that Moderna was going to host an investor call or release earnings in the next month, and you wanted to protect your long position. Well, options have expiration dates, and the dates of expiration are usually on Fridays. So let's right here select expiration date of Friday, April 19th. And now let's scroll down here to puts. And here we see the strike price. And what the strike price means is if the stock goes below a certain price level, then it will make money more or less. And if we scroll down some more here, we see the background color is blue for the strike prices at $105 or above. And this means that these put options are in the money. And you can purchase a put to protect your long position. Again, this is called a married put. And many people that work for tech companies have over 90% of their net worth tied up in the stock of the company they work for, including shares that the employees are not yet allowed to sell. So what they do is they buy puts to protect their net worth. And you might be thinking, hey, why not just sell the stock? Well, you might have to pay a lot in taxes if you do, because in many countries, you have to pay higher taxes if you sell something that you've owned for less than one year. Now, please be careful with options and practice a lot and never underwrite, meaning never sell options, as you can lose much more money than you invested if you're randomly assigned, as explained in this graphic here. Topic two, how to reduce the risk of this happening to you. You're fired. I'm fired. That's what he said. Now, a way to ensure that the probability of you losing your job decreases is to do the following. Every three months, ask your boss if they have a few minutes to grab a coffee. Then if true, start with this. I really enjoy our team and together we've accomplished a lot and I'm really proud of our accomplishments. And I wanna ask you what I can do to add more value to our team. And also what additional value I need to add to be considered for a promotion or a raise. As you know, it's expensive to raise a family here and I wanna provide the best standard of living for my family. And bring a notebook as well and write down everything they tell you. And feedback is crucial. And if you're worried about being let go, then a quarterly meeting like this can help you a lot. Also, closed mouths don't get fed. So based on what you wrote down, later on that year, when your boss congratulates you on a job well done, then say thank you. And then you say, please let me know if you have time for coffee. Then start the meeting again with something like this. As a team, we've accomplished so much. And earlier this year, we sat down and I humbly asked you what I need to accomplish in order to be considered for a promotion or a raise. And as you know, it's expensive uh, raising a family here. And I gotta turn the green screen off for a second there. It's expensive raising a family here. Uh, and I'd love to please ask you for a promotion or a raise. Now. If they say not yet, then you can ask them what additional value you can add to the team. And the secret is that everybody around you that's in a more senior position than you, they've asked many, many times to be promoted behind closed doors. You just don't see that. In fact, if you're frustrated at what other, why other people around you are making more money than you and getting promoted faster than you, it's probably because they asked a lot and you have not yet. And if you want anything in life, you have to ask. And working in a company is not like in school where you kept your head down, you got good grades and life worked out well. You gotta ask and you need to remind your boss of your accomplishments. And asking for feedback is crucial because many managers got to where they are because they're good at skill X, like programming in a tech company or trading in a finance company. Yeah, they might be good at skill X, but they might not be very good at managing people, which is why you need to be self-promotional. And there's ways to brag about your accomplishments in a meeting. You can start with the usual, we've accomplished a lot as a team, if true. Uh, and then you can brag by saying, I humbly have accomplished this, this, and this. Now, oh, this is important. If you go out for a coffee with your manager and the bill uh, arrives, please do exactly this. This is really important. Oh, look at me. I have alligator hands. I can't find my wallet. Also, T-Rex can't do push-ups. All right. Now, companies, 
companies often cut into muscle and not just fat when they're firing. You know, they, they tend to overdo it. And so another way to ensure that you don't get let go is to find mentors or Yodas in your company and sit down with them once per quarter to ask them for feedback on how to progress at, at the company. And every company has got a different corporate culture and they know the rules. They've been there longer than you have probably. Now, the most important mentor you might have is your boss's assistant because they likely have worked with your boss at multiple companies and they know how decisions are made and they will be so happy to mentor you if you ask. Now, additional ways to ensure job security, and I hate saying this, but early on in your career, FaceTime matters. Be first in and last out, Philo. Also, don't ever trust anyone at work if you want to leave. Like, don't tell people that you want to leave and maybe do an MBA one day, or they can let that slip if there's a round of cost cuts coming or if they've had a couple drinks and they're out with buddies. Also, if you work in sales at a company and you get promoted, please, 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 please keep at least one large customer that you can manage as the last people to let go are the ones that have important customer relationships. In fact, try to be even more resourceful to help in the company sell more in order to retain your job when cost cuts occur. Now, my uncle worked for General Electric for many years. And when I started working, he told me, Chris, be a nice dumb guy. I had no idea what he was talking about then, but now I kind of get it because you don't want to gossip at work and you don't ever want to go over your boss's head and you don't want to appear as a threat to your boss or they might think they hired their assassin. Speaking of nice guys, Mafi here did not get fired. He fired me. You know, never listen to me about like that between 9.30 and 4. How could I fire you? I love you, Mafi. Topic three, what is the one quality that many billionaires like Bobby have in common? I was just thinking about getting rich and getting even. Have you? Yeah, mostly. Does it make everything all better? Why doesn't it? Now, many billionaires have a chip on their shoulder. It's not just about money. It's about proving the world wrong. For example, Elon Musk was beaten up a lot when he was a kid. And please read this book right here. Uh, on Elon Musk. I just finished the Audible version. It's awesome. And a result of, of getting you know, mistreated when he was younger, Elon is not just about making money. He wants to prove something. And when I worked in the venture capital sector, we invested in a company where Sequoia led the A round and my venture capital firm led the B round. And I had a board seat on the company. And as a result, I got to spend time one-on-one -on -one with Doug Leone from Sequoia, who's a rock star. Now the top 10 venture capital firms in the world have 1% of their investments in unicorns, meaning companies worth over a billion dollars. And Sequoia has 5% of their investments in unicorns. And so I asked Doug, why are you so, so successful? Why is Sequoia always so successful? And he explained to me that the jockey is more important than the horse, meaning the entrepreneur is more important than the business model. In fact, if we go to Sequoia's website, sequoiacap.com together, here we see that they profile the entrepreneur first and less so the company. I asked Doug, what kinds of people do you invest in? He told me, and I'm gonna butcher this explanation, but he told me that the people that kill it as entrepreneurs had something happen to them earlier in their lives that maybe leads them to believe that they have something to prove or they want to prove the world wrong, meaning maybe a chip on their shoulder. And these are the best founders to invest in because like Steve Jobs, they want to put a dent in the universe and not sell the company for a couple million dollars or even a few hundred billion dollars. They want to make their mark. And Bobby Axelrod clearly wants to prove people wrong as well. So whatever your biggest perceived weakness is in life, I want you to embrace it and turn it into your biggest strength. Maybe your self-image is creating a blind spot. Well, let's assume your blind spot usually works for you. It's fairly essential if you don't feel indestructible like Superman. Now, your blind spot is a euphemism for your perceived weakness. And we can turn that weakness into your kryptonite. But first, 
you have to keep the following in mind. I'm certainly not an artist here, but here I go. All right, this is the most important chart you'll ever see in your life, okay? On this axis here, we have, I'm looking up the monitor up top, see if I'm in frame. This axis here, we have age, and on this axis, we have give a darn. So when you're younger, you're down here. You don't really care what people think, right? You have meltdowns in restaurants, whatever, you don't care. When you're older, you also don't really care what people think. The problem is when you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, sometimes even later, you're up here. You give a damn what people think of you. And I call this the triangle of despair, okay? And you need to avoid this at all costs in your life. And you need to live at this level right here, which is where all the best entrepreneurs live. They really don't care what people think about them. I'm not saying being rude or disingenuous, but I'm just saying, stop focusing on what other people are thinking of because they're probably not thinking of you. They have their own problems as well. And I say it with love in my heart, as you know. And so confidence is everything in your life and nobody is smarter than you. And I believe that with my whole heart that I licensed this life-changing short interview with Steve Jobs from the Silicon Valley Historical Association. So the thing I would say is when you grow up, you tend to get told that the world is the way it is and your, your life is just to live your life inside the world, try not to bash into the walls too much, uh, uh, try to have a nice family life, uh, have fun, save a little money. Um, but life, that, that's a very limited life. Life can be much broader once you discover one simple fact, and that is everything around you that you call life was made up by people that were no smarter than you. And you can change it. You can influence it. You can, you can build your own things that other people can use. And the minute that you understand that you can poke life and actually something will, you know, if you push in, something will pop out the other side, that you can, you can change it. You can mold it. Um, that's maybe the most important thing, is to shake off this, uh, th this uh, erroneous notion that life is, is there and you're just going to live in it, versus embrace it, change it, improve it, make your mark upon it. Um, I, I think that's very important. And however you learn that, once you learn it, uh, you'll want to change life and make it better because it's kind of messed up in a lot of ways. Um, once you learn that, you'll never be the same again. All right, I hope you're fired up. Okay, time for homework. In addition to eliminating that triangle despair, I want you to please get a piece of paper and a pencil. Do that now, please. Pause me until you have it handy. Now, in order to eliminate self-sabotage, I want you to write down this. Ready? I don't care about X. Do that 10 times. For example, I don't care that I'm 52, man child, and I still play video games. And by the way, when GTA 6 comes out in 2025, I'm not gonna be teaching for at least a month, man, until I finish GTA 6. I want you to write it out 10 times, okay? Uh, I don't care about X. Like, I don't care that I have the most obvious hair dye. Or I don't care that my nose is so ginormous. It's huge. Because I can beat anybody in a ski race, right? This damn thing is aerodynamic. Do that 10 times, please. And remember this, please. As Steve Jobs said, your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. Follow your passion. Fail a lot. Don't care what people think about you and your dreams will come true and the money will follow accidentally. It always does, I promise you. Now let's talk about grading this episode for Wall Street Realism with a buy, hold, or sell rating. Now the episode did a good job of showing us why we need to have good risk management metrics in place, perhaps using options or SOP losses or assessing the risk versus return. However, AXA's use of channel checks for an FDA approval is not accurate because channel checks usually refers to figuring out how sales are tracking. Also, the volatile nature of firing Mafi and then rehiring him is great writing, but this, is, this does not happen in hedge funds. Separately, the episode did a superb job in analyzing what makes Bobby Axelrod tick, especially in his conversations with Wendy. 
As a result, I'm going to give this episode a hold rating. Please like, comment, and subscribe. And I will see you soon in our next reaction video when we react to episode 12, which is the final episode of season one. Thank you.